-hmm. Okay. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, sure. And thanks for having me here. Um, my name is Audra Angelique, and I've been in the entertainment industry all my life. First as an award-winning vocalist um, and an actor and theater and opera and things like that. And then I ended up being a marketing director when I was 21 for an acting school and uh, kept moving through that. And I've done multiple things in the entertainment industry. I'm a producer, uh, videography, web de graphic design, pretty much anything, all the way leading up to be a creative director. Now um, I'm more immersed in the film and TV world. So now I'm an executive producer on a film that's coming. Uh, it's going to be a feature film about um, suicide. And uh, I'm a composer, so I composed recently a short film. Uh, and I'll be doing some things for that film as well. So that's a little snippet about Audra. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome, Audra. Thank you for joining our, our panelists. Um, Victor, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what you do? Hey, Thanks everybody for joining. Um, my name is Victor Smith. I'm a consultant. I work primarily in the nexus between finance, uh, various technologies, and I've also had experience in the hospitality industry. Um, I have a good background in when businesses combine, uh, called M&A integration, mergers, acquisitions, divestures, and also all that sort of stuff that the corporate heads do. But when they make those decisions, it changes how companies work. It changes the regulations they need to meet. It changes their systems. And that's why I get hands-on involved in that. Um, right now, we see a trend of AI-enabled applications, products, services going across industries all at once. So many of lessons learned applied in finance are applicable to other um, industries, industry sectors, especially in the entertainment industry, sports, and the data that supports those businesses, very important. So um, me personally, born and raised in the Bronx, I'm a New Yorker, uh, went to school there, grew up there, uh, ups and downs, but definitely um, I love the city and I loved it so much I moved. <laughs> and now uh, my family and I, we're here in Pennsylvania and we love travel. We love to experience and expand across different cultures different languages, so I'm pretty good at Spanish, family, uh, Spanish speaking, etc. And, you know, just enjoy all the food, cuisines, and the good things that people share. Okay, thank you, Victor. Welcome, welcome. Um, Carlos, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what you did? Um, so, hi, my name is Carlos. Uh, I go by Carlos Phoenix. Uh, simply put, uh, I started very young at the age of 15 in advertising. Uh, by 19, I ended up working in the entertainment industry, uh, starting with storyboards, going into art directing and building sets. Uh, so I worked in the art department primarily, worked in music videos, TV shows, commercials, uh, some award winning, some just recognized, um, and a lot of top artists, music artists. Uh, I also was a sci-fi fantasy illustrator in between working in movies and TV shows. So I worked on other aspects and areas of the entertainment industry from advertising and marketing to doing illustrations for everything from comic books for Marvel um, and a few other independent comic books. Uh, but then I got into post-production, uh, editing, video, and so on, which then led into doing live streaming and that entered the game to my businesses. So uh, so I run a, a pretty cool businesses. One is Live Streaming Master, where I basically, uh, we're about hooking up businesses and content creators and even media companies uh, with awesome gear like TV studio gear or home live streaming gear and studio setups to get to the next generation of content creation. From there, I started a podcast network. Uh, my personal podcast is called Garage the Brand uh, com. If you want to check that out, where I interview celebrities. Uh, the reason it's called Podcast um, Garage is because if you think about all the big multi-billion-dollar companies, uh, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, they all started from a garage. So when I interview these celebrities, we talk about not what their next project project is, but more about how the hell did you get to be where you are? So that's uh, the podcast network. The next thing is Nexus Media Group, which is basically part of what I was mentioning earlier. Uh, it's my first strategy to building a independent uh, Netflix, for lack of better words, 
So we'll be developing TV shows and films and that type of thing. But I will also incorporate live events such as uh, concerts, sporting events, and so on. Uh, and tell us who you are and uh, what you do. Okay, great. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Darian Donju. I am a filmmaker based here in lovely Atlanta, Georgia, um, where, you know, I, I had the great fortune of being born in New York, but being raised here in Atlanta and then having my number one passion, which is making movies, uh, have that actually come to my city <laughs> as I as I lived here. I mean, it, it, it almost felt like I was the one pulling the film industry uh, to Atlanta. Um, so that was, that was a great fortunate thing that, that sort of just came my way. Um, but I, yeah, I, I came in through the indie route. Um, Atlanta is a great place for that through collaborations with, uh, filmmakers here in Atlanta, uh, making a number of shorts, working on other people's shorts and having us all just grow, you know, together in the industry. Uh, my short films are, have been acclaimed at multiple film festivals, and I've had millions of views of my short films online um, and then uh, been able to then work on um, larger and larger productions. I've been visual effects supervisor on um, on a few features um, that, that have gotten sold and, and have been in theaters. So that was kind of like a, a nice moment to be able to know that I was the person that made the monster for a film that, you know, that is showing in theaters. And uh, and I've also worked for uh, I worked for two and a half years uh, in visual effects for Digital Domain, um, which for those who who may not be aware is a um, uh, an award winning visual effects company started by James Cameron about thirty years ago, and uh, you know we've done visual effects on movies such as Wakanda Forever, Spider Man No Way Home, Stranger Things, uh, The Last of Us. So so just quite a number of uh, you know, I've just been able to see that trajectory from starting off making films, you know, in my living room to being able to kind of climb through different ranks and opportunities to be able to work on some of the some of the biggest films. And now I'm proud to call myself an AI filmmaker. Um, and I just recently completed a, a nine and a half minute uh, AI, all AI film. It's it, everything in its AI from the music to the voices to the visuals. Uh, everything is AI except for the work that I did, which is manual. Um, and I just submitted that to the Runway AI Film Festival. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm very much, very much aggressively now down going down the path of making films with with AI. So, that's kind of I think what brings me to you guys. Well, thank you, um, and thank you to all of the panelists for um, you know uh, joining us. Um, hopefully. You guys now see that uh, I think we've got a great panel. We're going to have a great discussion. Um, one quick thing. I do want to have an acknowledgement um, for one of our co-hosts, um, Jennifer Trujillo. I want to thank you very, very much because you are the person who brought to me Darian and Audra. So, And they are great, great panelists. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your for your support and thank you for helping to run this event. All right, so let's kick off. Let's, let's, let's get it down. Now, if you're, <laughs> and I hope my, uh, my, my audience won't uh, get um, offended by using this term. If, uh, so for all the normies out there, and I hope my guests won't get, because <laughs> we're, we're, we're enthusiasts, but not everyone knows when we say AI, particularly generative AI, what in the hell is generative AI? So why don't we start there as to you know what it is? Uh, Mr. Smith, do you want to kick kick that one off? Yeah, um, an easy way to think about it, if I had to explain it to a four or six year old, is getting computers to do the work we want them to do without explicitly programming them for each task. And generative AI allows you to, you set the framework, the scope of the type of things that um, they'll be trained on. You train that model up. Um, so a lot of folks have heard the term about large language models, LLM, but there's some other tools and processes that are involved in that. But basically you create the model, you train it, give it directives, types, prototypes, archetypes, 
and then it infers what the meanings are behind it and then leverages the large language model to receive instructions in English um, uh, or and then respond in English. You could also do that with code, like some people may use SQL, Python, different languages, coding languages, they're really techie developers, but most individuals will be using what we call prompts. And the prompts are ways you enter instructions. The AI interprets those instructions based on what it's been trained to provide the output you're asking. Anybody else want to add, um, you know, add to that? Well, this is Audra. One, one thing I'll say too, that I've noticed that there's a little bit of confusion uh, in the world of what like AGI even means. And people seem to think that it means generative because so many people are now, consumers are now using generative AI um, for free a lot, but really that means uh, a, something different. And I wonder if somebody else would want to talk about that. Yeah, I, I could I could jump in real quick then to, to piggyback, uh, to use a clubhouse. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to piggyback on Audra's statement then. So AGI obviously is a big deal that's coming, um, which is artificial general intelligence. And that's the kind of thing that OpenAI and Sam Altman, you know, there's a whole back and forth between Elon Musk and Sam Altman and all the arguments over who's going to control the company because they feel like they probably have something that is probably close to artificial general intelligence, which just means an artificial intelligence that can do anything. So the artificial intelligence that we're talking about, when we talk about generative AI, uh, you know, Victor mentioned like ChatGPT, for example, or other LLMs, or MidJourney. MidJourney is targeted to do one thing. So you type in a text prompt and it generates an image, right? It, it doesn't do different things. It's not gonna go wash your dishes for you. It's not gonna figure out, you know, what days you should try to take off work uh, or what jobs to apply to. Um, it it AI right now, the ones that we've been so excited about are ones that they come out, they do that one thing, they try to do that very well. And, um, and artificial general intelligence is different because that's the type of intelligence that basically what they're saying is you can basically apply it to any task and it'll just figure out how to do it. So obviously that's like the holy grail. But I think what we're talking about today is more on the generative AI as that applies to filmmaking and not so much the AGI, which is artificial general intelligence. Okay, I think we, um, go ahead, Carlos, you want to add to that? Uh, again, the AGI, uh, what people may recognize AGI as is Terminator, you know, because it has the ability to think and figure out things and then have a physical body to be able to incorporate and do those things. Uh, and it may have access to history and all sorts of stuff. So if you ever watch the movies and he's yapping about that stuff, you know, so that goes into a very deep, you know, discussion, which I don't think is what we're trying to discuss today. Uh, but you're right, and, and generative is just like um, creating a funnel of people's knowledge and then bring it down to this, you know, uh, a center that's going to rationalize it all and then give you access to some of the thoughts of the world um, in, and a lot of the information in the world and then give you results based on whatever it is you're asking that may, you know, it's almost like when you do a Google search. Uh, and Google just goes to the whole internet, sees what everybody has said about it, and then brings you the top. But it has other algorithms that's, that makes more of a competition than, you know, competition in terms of which information is the correct information, where AI, hopefully, um, if they can figure it out correctly, will give you a thought out answer that can be fooled. And, and that's part of these, the fear that people seem to have with AI in, in general. And one thing I just Thank want to add for... to that, if you don't mind, Gregory, sure. is, you know, we're talking about like narrow AI, right? Which is like the only thing that we use as humans. It's been around for a long time and it's evolving and moving forward with all these things we're doing now with it. But the other two don't really exist yet. Like super intelligence, being aware of itself, right? Like the Terminator being aware right. that it exists. That's like theoretical. The the other stuff, the AGI we're talking about, theoretical, right? Everything we do now, so people don't need to be afraid. Everything we're doing now is just a tool. It's like we can figure out how to use this tool for whatever we need it to do, to do things quicker, faster, better than you know we could do it before. And it's super helpful for like a million things, an infinite amount of things, really. Right. Yeah, this is not about 
um, and, and this is a good segue into the next question. This is not about necessarily replacing humans, although there's no question about it. It will impact the way some humans do their job. There's no, there's no question about that. But that that's a good thing, um, you know. But it's giving. It's about giving people m tools that will help them be more productive. It's you know, um, it's definitely not in my opinion, not at a point where, you know, you can replace a human actor, you know, with a totally generated, um, it, it can't do that because there's a, there's a whole lot of nuance in performance that it does not yet understand. Um, so it's very important that you, you know, you make that distinction about what the current capabilities of generative AI is and, and know that, okay, that's not really where I think many people are, or hopefully most people are trying to go with it. Um, if you want to use this new technology, you're thinking of it as a tool, which segues into the next question then. So what is a good use, if you will, um, of AI? Okay, so I guess if I'm going to ask, and I, and that's why I put the, put the question exactly because when you say what's a good use, well, yeah. then that kind of forces the definition of what would be a bad use of AI. Got it, got it. So if you were trying to replace, you know, let's say, and this is my opinion, um, you know, the person who creates maps on a okay, I'm using a, an industry term that not everybody would understand. Let me. Um, could you give people just a real quick, simple explanation of what a map is and um, how it's used in films and television? Well, mostly films. Yeah, absolutely. So maps are basically the backgrounds, right? So we have people that 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 paint those. They digitally paint backgrounds and make these really cool, you know, you know images. And that work probably will not have to be done by hand anymore the way it's been done right now ai i i can generate an amazing background in ai um in in, in literally minutes um and so but but i you know that is an opportunity because you got to ask yourself those people who were you know was that the pinnacle of what they wanted to do right and i even think about people who are working on a film set 99 percent of people who work on film sets that was not their dream to be schlepping, you know, sandbags, you know, across from one part of the set. And most people who got into film got in with big ideas, wanting to make movies, wanting to tell their stories. But most people who work in film do not get to do that because it's cost prohibitive. There's a lot of gatekeeping. There's a lot of they're just, you know, it's just so expensive to do the kinds of ideas they want to do. And, and the reason I see AI as a very, very positive thing is I think it will allow more people to be able to actually do the thing that they got into the movie industry to do, which was not carry C stands and, and, and lift lights necessarily. Some people, yes, but for a lot of people, they wanna make actual films. And AI is creating a situation where you actually can do those things without having to hire a company like Digital Domain. Uh, if you read the credits of some of these big Marvel movies, some of them have over 15,000 people that worked on the film, right? So if you think about that, that means there are only like nine or 10 people in the world who will ever be able to, you know, if you're not James Cameron, Steven Spielberg, Peter Jackson, or who are, you know, whatever, you're not going to be able to have that many people working for you to behind your vision. But with AI, you're reducing the number of people that it takes to do that, which means more of us will likely be able to tell our stories going forward. So a AI is, is definitely going to change um, a lot of aspects. Um, I think some of the fear, um, it, it probably is warranted in the sense that people don't like change. And so to the extent that some people don't want to have to change their routines or their approaches, then that's scary. But as far as it like eliminating opportunities and making it so that we don't we're not able to be fruitful and provide for ourselves i don't think that is a fear that should be a problem i'll give an example um back 
there was a there was a time where that was a very scary time when 3D animation was a big was becoming a big deal. And if you remember in the 80s and into the 90s, 2D animation was huge with Disney animation, for example, The Lion King and Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, those types of movies were the pinnacle of children's animation. But with Pixar coming in with the new technology of 3D, there seemed to be a threat that was looming, which, which was that they were going to eliminate 2D animation, which they did, right? So at for a time. And so there were a lot of, you know, 2D animators that worked for Disney in Florida, I, I believe at least up to probably 3,000 that were let go by Disney. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing that people fear. But I think in hindsight, as we look at the industry, we realize that more artists are actually now employed by the fact that we have 3D because now it's not just Disney and, you know, DreamWorks producing these things. There are multitude of, you can't even count how many companies because of 3D that are now able to make children's films. And so the number of people that are working to produce animated content and animated material and features is way more than the 3000 people that were unfortunately at that time, that's a very troublesome period for them. But if we look at it on a macro scale, there's a lot more animation going on, an animation work going on and creative animation going on than was what was before 3D. And I think with AI, it's a very similar thing. To uh, the only thing I could say to add is um, back in the day before Pixar even released an animated film, I was in the process of trying to create the first 3D animated film. And we got investment here in New York. Uh, and we had distribution with Sony. Uh, everything fell apart. And back in the day, uh, the computers were in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. The software was extremely expensive and so on. And that's where the age that we're in right now, as far as AI, where, um, you know, the costs are starting to go down because major corporations are investing in the specific companies that are doing it. But over time, we're all going to have our own version and access to AI and develop our own AIs to do the things that we wanted to do, whether it's in the household or in the office and so on. So there's always like a, a phase where it's too cost prohibitive for everybody to just jump in. But what's happening here now is that there's tools that are being developed that allows us to play and, and get a sneak peek at what the long-term potential is. And I, I see it as an opportunity, like uh, Darian is saying, because if we start understanding that this is gonna be a big, massive change uh, and, and it's, gonna, it's not gonna go away, uh, then people can start studying it now and preparing for it so that when their job is now removed, because I start, the reason I got into art was because I wanted to be in a matte painter for George Lucas, who created Pixar. And, you know, back in those days, he didn't want 3D animation in the way that Pixar was developing it. So he sold it to Steve Jobs. But when I was doing matte paintings, he was going into um, 3D stuff to do what we're talking about now, which is to replace backgrounds with computer graphics instead of oil paintings on glass, which is how it was originally done. And I studied oil painting to do to be that. And then by the time I got into it, it was gone and already removed because computers were doing it. And if I had prepared correctly, I should have been learning the computer stuff first or in the process of doing the oil stuff so that I could have been in that industry the way I originally mm -hmm. wanted to. By the time I got the, the industry switched and changed, I was tired. <laughs> like I didn't want to learn all that again. But we're right now in that blurry, that blurry stage of we have an opportunity to learn whatever might fit in our criteria, whether it's how to use it for writing, how to use it for image creation, how to use it for backgrounds. Um, it's, a, it's a magical time of opportunity that if your mind allows you to jump in, and I know some of us that might be on the older side, we don't want to learn something new, but I think it's been placed in front of us in such a simple format and understanding how to uh, type in prompts that you can get results that are going to be great for you and your business or your creativity. And I think that's part of what this conversation can uh, wake us all up to so that we can be better prepared for the future of either entertainment or production or whatever other elements in your work environment and life is. Well said. Thank you, Sarah. Um...
I think what I want to do now is this would be um, probably, we're going to have one more round of Q&A, but if there are any questions or anyone wants to interject in the conversation now, um, you know, please do. What I would ask is if you want to make a comment or say something, raise your virtual hand just so that we have a orderly, um, uh, you know, we can call on you and, and we keep things kind of orderly. So um, do you want to say something? And we have the first person starting off. Um, Charles, go ahead. Uh, questions for either, those, um, either Carlos, Darian, or even Audra. If you, when you're looking to uh, manage your data, uh, meaning that if you're using, you're using AI, generative AI, particularly the, the players like Microsoft, a AWS, or Google, who have you found to give you the best service as far as managing your data, uh, help you set up your VMs and things like that? Who have you found to, be, to have serviced you the best? I guess I'll try to go first. Um, I actually have all of them open all the time. And I ask them all the same questions. Well, I try to use the same type of prompts. And then based on the responses I get, the one that's given me the ones that I think are what I'm looking for, I then elaborate further and further with that one. Uh, that way I maximize what's... So you'll learn that each one is good for different scenarios. And um, outside of image creation and stuff like that, because there's other... Uh, I was just mentioning earlier in the green room where I have installed on my phone um, over 20 different AI apps. And, you know, we only hear about the standard three <laughs> or two because uh, Copilot technically is like ChatGPT, but with the other image stuff built in. <clears throat> um, but it, it it's incredible. But here's, here's another stat. Uh, Apple, which, you know, we're not hearing in the conversation that often, right? Uh, has acquired almost 100 different companies in AI in the past three years. So you will, you'll notice if you've looked at Apple's history, they're not the first to come up with an MP3 player. They're not the first to come up with a lot of the different devices um, that we've you know been playing with. Uh, but what they do is they literally, they look at how these guys are doing it. They're watching how we interact with it and what we're really interested in. And then they smack our faces with it and say, we're going to slaughter all of that. So there's, there's a lot of stuff that we haven't been exposed to yet that we will be. And so this is nothing. Like what we're doing right now, what we have played with right now, um, we'll use it as the learning experience because it's the beginning process. That's why I'm saying that right now is the blurry uh, time of opportunity of just jump in now, jump in get your kids to jump in, get grandma to jump in, get everybody to jump in because all that data that they're collecting, which is the fearsome part, right? That's the part that we kind of get scared of, of, well, how much privacy is it? Is there in it? Oh, but what about copyright? All those are the things that we get concerned about. But in, in terms of knowing it, we know they're not going to stop. You know, we know eventually self-driving cars are going to continue, right? We just have to know how to press the right buttons to let it learn how it's going to learn. Well, the more we figure out how we're supposed to engage with it and the more it learns and gives us the answers we want, the better, because when the future tools come out, it's going to be way more advanced. And if you're already ready for that, then you're the boss. But do, you, so that's do you have a view on, like right now, understanding the technology will advance, but right mm -hmm. now, is there, do you have a preferred vendor of choice? Well, lack of a better way. I mean, is it someone's tool that kind of stands out for you or are they all kind of, they all have their pluses and minuses? So because I'm a geek, I have uh, I have concerns as far as uh, biases. You know, like I think Google has too much access to my information, but then there's a, a, a hip hop artist that worked with Google to come up with an AI to come up with not only lyrics for hip hop music, but also uh and antonyms and synonyms and all these other creative words based on sound and rhyme and i'm like you know what how can i be mad at google you know there, there's um there's privacy concerns but then there's like all this creativity that's happening so honestly uh, i downloaded the 20 apps because each one 
does something better over the other, but it doesn't knock out the other. So I can't, I can't really, um, I mean, chat GPT because it's the most recognized. It's probably my first go-to if I want something quick that I know that everybody's going to give me a, a fairly general same answer. But I usually use them when I'm like busy and I have to come up with a quick thought, like a quick email. And I have to say, well, you know, write me an email stating what my business is about. And because you've been writing about your business in it, after about a month, it like just knows your business. And it's like, oh, yep, I got you. So it takes less than a prompt. And then it gives you a result that's like, hey, we're brothers now. I know everything you're talking about. I'm going to give you the exact answer you're looking for. And that's kind of what we have to learn is that the more we're feeding it, the more it gets to know you. And then it doesn't take as much effort to kind of get what you want back. Yeah, Victor, go ahead. Um, chime in. Yeah, and I think also your perspective, what role you're playing, um, will affect your your that question. Because if you're looking at it from an infrastructure, I'm building this up for a business application, you're going to have certain needs about how much data is being transferred, how that data is being ring fenced, protected, that let's say you're using um, Watson X. If I put a bunch of my business data in Watson X and now I'm using this model to learn so it can do stuff I want for my AI applications for my business, Watson X better not be using what it learned from me for my competitor. So those are different series of questions that you need to ask and you'll have to kind of like come up with your 21 questions and go to each service provider and say, how are you doing this? How are you protecting me here? What's the cost of this? Are you going to charge me more for CPU, for GPUs versus CPUs versus blah, blah? It goes on and on. So you'll need a good team. If you're not the key person in all that, you'll need a good team to help guide you on how to make the right purchase decisions for the infrastructure you're going to buy to run your AI embedded applications. I do that. And some friends of mine, we do that as well. So that's like part of our day job. Um, when you're looking at from an end user perspective on the creative process, there are tools that are specific or really good at like mid journey, right? Everybody's talking about mid journey and how it's doing all these great, I don't know if it does animation, but at least some of the screenshots, some of those stills are great. And they may have really good applications in creative, fast tracking creative content. Um, I got with my daughter over a weekend, a couple Saturdays ago, we made like, just to kick the can. We hopped on, used a free AI video tool and we created a little video and we have fun doing it. But I know if you put me in front of some video editing software, I, it wouldn't happen. The camera would never be still enough. It wouldn't be good enough. I wouldn't have been able to do it. And I think that is where we'll see a lot of AI tools help fast track the prototype and the initial sets of creative processes so we could sell our vision better. So I think what I'm hearing, and I think the way we can kind of sum this up is um, it's going to depend upon what what it is you're trying to do. Certain tools out there are are good at you know one thing versus another. Some some are good at the initial stages, um, and I'm certainly not an AI expert. I'm I'm diving into this world myself, um, but I I think. I think, and panelists, correct me if you disagree with my my conclusion here. I think what the the tool is going to, you know, what the best tool is going to depend on what specific task are you trying to do. There are certain tasks that are going to be better done with one tool versus another, or it, it also might come down to it might work. You know, you just might like the way one tool works better than the other. You know, not a, a personal preference out there. So I think that's a, a it's a harder question to say across the board. Um, definitively, you know what's what's best. It depends upon the task and and your work preferences. Is that well? You also keep in mind that a lot of corporations are implementing AI inside of their own framework that's not accessible through the internet. So, for example, uh, Salesforce. You know, Salesforce has got your tools. For your corporation so anything you're feeding the insides of your own salesforce is what a, the, that ai will be using i use notion uh, notion uses the ai about everything that's inside of your own notion 
to give you responses and answers based on what's going on inside of your your information as opposed to going to the internet trying to grab information so uh so that's another thing to consider uh if you're using the standard you know what we call standard standard uh you know chat gpt and that type of stuff all that that you're sharing even though it's in your own account it's still using the internet and sharing that with the internet in its own algorithmic kind of way so keep in mind that if you're doing uh let's say writing a script that's uh, you know, let's say you're writing a script and I'm doing it because you probably shouldn't be. But, you know, let's just say you're using it for your first concept. Um, you know, those ideas are going to be thrown into the Internet. If a company writes a special script software where your AI is within your own account. Uh, I mean, earlier I was going to say some things about our, the good AI as well. I was going to talk a little bit more about communication, but then um, we have a question in the chat and uh, what was her name? Where did it go? Where did it go? Kathleen. Kathleen, Kathleen was yeah. asking about what the best uh, storyboarding, you know, backgrounds uh, would be what people are using. And I was just typing to her again, because I prefer Adobe products. That's, that's just me. I'm a huge Adobe a person I worked with them years ago um, and I used the products like Macromedia before they merged with Adobe. And then from there, it's like I everything they're doing with AI is my favorite. And I was just about to say that you can, I think you can still sign up for a free Adobe Express to try some of their generative AI stuff too. And they've just added uh, in the last few months photos. So you can actually a prompt and get like a photo response that looks like a realistic photograph instead of just like these cartoony things um, that they were doing prior. So you might want to play around with that. And then a lot of people use mid journey and Darian um, uses that one a lot. Uh, I don't know if he wants to put his uh, link to join your server, your discord or all that in the chat for anybody that's uh, on here, but that would probably be helpful. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for that. Uh, Darian, do you want to add anything to or? Yeah, yeah. So I, I can just, I mean, you know, so it can specifically to the mid journey and, and Photoshop thing. So I use those two as kind of a, a back and forth cycle. So mid journey is in my opinion, the best image generator. And, uh, and then Photoshop is Photoshop, right? It's, it's, the, it's the best, right? At, at being Photoshop. And so basically a lot of what I'll do is I'll, I might generate something in mid journey and then I'll take that into Photoshop and then tweak it, move it, collage it into a different composition. And then I might take that collaged image and put that back into to mid journey and then um, have mid journey smooth it all back out into a new image that respects the composition roughly that I, that I created. Um, and I also use the generative tools in, in, in Photoshop. Like for example, if I need the, let's say I generate something in mid journey and I need, I need it to be extended. So, uh, generative fill in photo in Photoshop is great. So I can take a picture that might've been a square, but I need it to be horizontal. So I can just say, you know, in, in, in Photoshop, you know, fill that in and it'll do a great job of that. So I, I think it's kind of back to the idea that it's multiple tools. And so for anybody who wants to kind of, these are the tools I used on my short film. So it was Mid Journey, Runway for Motion, uh, Chat GPT for assistance with scripts and ideas and outlining and a whole bunch of research and a whole bunch of other things. 11 Labs for voice. So that's for generating voices. So, so me and Jerry Thomas and the other people I worked with, we did voices and then we changed the voices using 11 labs into completely different voices. Uh, hey Jen to make the characters actually talk. Ava for creating music, although Sono is really good as well. And Adobe Creative Cloud and DaVinci Resolve. So that's my entire, that was my entire short film stack that I used for that. So, so let's do this. Um, Victor has already sent me a list of his um, AI sources. Um, novices. Why don't I circle you guys, back? You guys are too advanced <laughs> for me. <laughs> Those are for novices. Just kick the kick, you know, kicking the tires. Just playing, getting in the sandbox, getting started. <laughs> well, we've got you know all levels of experience here. So 
here's here's what we'll do. I'll ask, you know, I'll go back, I'll circle back with our panelists. I'll, if they have a list of uh, recommendations of software that they use that they want to share, uh, I'll get that list and then I'll circulate it to all the attendees. So you you have that information um, out there uh, and you know what these tools are and you can go and explain. The one thing, the one caveat I will give to all of you, especially to my actor friends, um, if it is now, normally my motto is, if it's for free, it's for me. And for those of you who know our dear friend Brooklyn Fields knows that that's what I first said. So if it's for free, it's for me. But when it's for free, you really need to read that fine print. If you scan a picture of yourself, that AI has your image. You're an actor, your brand is important to you. So if you start scanning pictures of yourself in that AI, when it goes to generate images, it knows how to make you. <laughs> and, you know, some of those images might start looking a little like you and you've given them the rights to do that. So read the fine print on the um, on the free stuff. That's my my one caveat. So let me kind of round out the discussion now and uh, ask this question. Um, you know, my recommendation to everyone is that AI is here to here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Um, we might as well start looking at this technology and say, well, how can we use this tool? How can we learn this tool? So the question that I ask to my panelists um, is what skills, if I'm interested and I wanna learn more about this, what skills? Is, should I, you know, be learning so that I know how to use this stuff? How do I get good at AI? No wants to tap by doing, I mean, by using it, by trying it. I mean, you gotta, you just have to jump in and get excited and see what it does for you. And then you'll think of all kinds of new ways and all kinds of things. I mean, it does all kinds of crazy things. Like just take chat GPT. Um, you can make tables and you can have it write code and you can have, I mean, there's so much that these things actually do. And then, you know, if you want a certain result, you know, one thing I think probably all of us have found is like, if you want a certain result, you have to like learn how to prompt it. So in order to learn how you prompt to get what you want in your head and use it as a tool for you, you have to practice. You have to, you know, just keep going and going regardless of what it is and then like with 11 labs because i love that app um the you know actually darian and i were messing around with that i guess a year and a half ago or something and i have a fairly unique voice right so it doesn't always pick up on all the frequencies of my voice and he's like well record something where you're just talking about a subject right then record something where you are uh, reading the script, then um, record something like I did something with music in the background and I did all kinds of things. So it would pick up on stuff. The more data I put in there for the voice to make like a voice that sounded like me, the better it sounded, right? Because it picks up on all those nuances. So, I mean, anyway, I'll just end there, but I would say you got to just do it. You got to jump in, you got to practice. One one quick follow up question for you, Audrey. Can you? Uh, well, actually, no. You you already did give us an example of of um, what you did. And uh, would you say how easy was it for you to learn how to you know how to work with AI until you got to? Well, are you at a place where you feel comfortable? Um, you know, not. I mean, obviously you can do a lot of different things, but what like for instance, in recording your voice and maybe you know, I don't know what extension to it, if you wanted to manipulate your voice or or just, you know, have it as an enhancement or whatever, how comfortable are you with now doing that? And how long would you say it took you to learn how to do that? Oh, I'm comfortable using any of these tools because they make, they're so really, to, I mean, I don't know. From my perspective, they're very easy to learn. Um, all the tools, anything that's AI related is fairly easy to to take on. Um and how much practice? I mean, for me, not much, because uh, I think when you do enough things uh, in the creative fields for long enough, 
you kind of just jump in with curiosity to learn quickly and you figure it out very quickly. Very quickly. We can do it very quick. Anyway, so, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's not difficult at all and people should not be afraid, you know? I, I agree with you. I think that, that's um, very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, Audrey, I agree with you. You got to um, be a driver in this thing, not a hitchhiker. You don't want to be the person still asking folks to help you set the timer on your VCR. You want to know how to use this thing. Get in there, use it, um, and give yourself some case studies, some examples, and just kick the tires. Go for it. I mean, and the first rule of, of, of computing, right, is garbage in, garbage out. So it's like, if you're going to feed it, a, <laughs> what you feed, it's what you're going to get. It's not like, it's not like doing really this stuff on its own, even though it seems like it. Like every time I get a result I love in chat GPT, I want to say, God, thank you so much. And then I have to stop myself. <laughs> like, this isn't a person. There's no feelings involved here. I'm saying thank you. And I don't think it feels the gratitude, right? If I may, I disagree with you on that. I think you should be thinking it now. Here's why. <laughs> obviously, obviously, it's not going to, um, you know, understand why you're thinking it and all that type of stuff. But from what I've learned is that the more you converse with it in a natural state of mind and thinking as if it's a person, the better the, prom the, the not the prompts, although the better you write the prompts as if it's conversational, but also the better the result of it giving you natural language in return. So it just food for thought, uh, you know, I get that it's not, you know, it's like thanking your bookshelf, but you get into the <laughs> habit of talking to it as if it was a person so that, um, that it, so that you're embedding that in your head uh, in terms of how you're conversing with AI in general. It's just something that I learned that, that I think it works yeah. very well. And I think gratitude is the best feeling ever. So I think you should always be thinking everything, even the bookshelf. You know what I mean? Like, and I do type it in there, but then I think about it. Like, am I being like ridiculous by, th by thinking this machine? Oh, it makes me laugh. All right, Jen. Miss Jen, you have a question. I'm going to point out uh, Belinda Fang in the comments said, what do you suggest for actors who want to learn how to use it while navigating all the negative sentiment from the other artists towards AI and how it replaces our jobs? Or what has your experience been defending your artistic integrity among other people who only see AI as something negative? And I might have comments, but Ooh, I want to I love that question. That. Yeah, thanks, Belinda. Uh, let me let me let me jump in on that one if I can, just because I do have an experience that's very very fresh. Um, so I've been making films uh, for, you know, going on nine years, uh, based mainly here in Atlanta, um, and I I regularly go to a thing called film film bar Monday, right, which takes place in Atlanta. And it's just a place for film people in the industry to get together in a, in a relaxed environment, chill out, talk and everything like that. Um, but I was at film bar Monday, this past Monday, you know, and I mentioned that I'd made, you know, my AI film, I had just finished the night before and submitted to the festival. So it's a, it was a great time to chill out next day, you know, have a few beers or whatever, and just, whoo, you know, finish type thing. And uh, yeah, we I, we ended up getting into a pretty heated discussion with uh, one guy ended up, he was yelling, he was full on yelling, you know, at me and, and at others who were having the conversation at the top of his lungs, right? It was to the point that there were other people saying, hey, man, can you calm down or whatever like that? And he was saying, you know, my friends and I, we will beat your ass we will beat your ass you know like like and I'm, I'm 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 lowering it just because we're in a professional environment but the level of vitriol was pretty high luckily i mean i'm pretty good at diffusing those things one i'm not scared of, of this guy trying to beat my ass that's one so but two um i stay very calm and i just you know i i continue to just just be at a, at a lower level and usually that that eventually diffuses people um but I, I think it's one of these things to answer the question that it's 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 a tough thing to navigate, but I do think it's important to stay strong and express the concept that it will create more opportunity. So I have a lot of actor friends uh, because I've made I've worked on a lot of films here in Atlanta, and I've helped act. If you help somebody move forward in what they're doing, 
for example, I've had friends that were looking for monologues to do. And I said, you know what? ChatGPT actually is a good way to generate monologues because let's say, for example, you're a black actress from Atlanta who's pissed off because they only give you angry black woman roles, right? Which is a major thing in, you know, for black actresses, uh, you know, working in Hollywood films. So I said, hey, listen, one thing you could do if you can't find the monologues that you need is you could actually generate a monologue for a character that would be your ideal character to play, right? So it's like, you don't have to go make the whole film, right? You can just go craft it, say that this is the character, create the scenario and have, you know, not everybody can write that well. You know, actors aren't necessarily trained as writers, but ChatGPT can help them and, and could help them craft a nice monologue and then now they've got something in a character that nobody else is writing for them. And so I think the more you can help people in their day to day, like on the ground level of what they're doing, then it, it will it, it tends to help alleviate some of that longer term fear of things that are ghosts. But, you know, they, they, these are big fears that haven't actually happened to most people yet. But if you can help them on a ground level now, then they'll be less fearful of some invisible thing that may or may not happen you know, year, a couple years from now or something, yeah. Charles, did you have an, another question as well? Uh, it's pretty much answered, it's pretty much answered um, it's towards Victor, specifically about data transfer. Um, if say, for instance, if you have your data images, generated AI scenes, backgrounds and, and whatnot transfer, you have it, so you have it stored on one um, data, uh, virtual server, and you want to, like we mentioned earlier about different tools that you would use, you wanted to transfer that data to, say, another, uh, you know, data farm or anything like that, another virtual machine. There's a data, or the transfer rates that are usually associated with that. I mean, because obviously you're doing this, it costs money to do anything and budget has to be followed, you know, sp specifically. So I wanted to ask Victor, do you generally see that? I haven't come across that as of yet. Thou shalt pay. That is the operating model for all of the cloud service providers. Some things they've commoditized and made simpler, easier, faster to do. But when it talks about large data sets, like you're talking terabytes, petabytes of data, you will pay. You will pay to move in. Think about moving your house. You'll pay to move. The more furniture you have, the more rooms, the higher the charge will be. That data transfer charge for onboarding, big cost. You got to watch that. Also, with usually within a cloud service provider, and I'm assuming you're going to use a cloud service provider for this to stand up your AI architecture, when you have that internally, depending on which services you select that's working around that LLM model or AI, whatever we just call a big umbrella, AI model and tools you're using, there may be charges for those services, the amount of data consumed, the CPUs. And CPUs are basically the, um, the computing power that you need. If you're doing learning, um, <sighs> machine learning, large language model, you're teaching it how to do its job, that's going to consume a lot of resources. And you usually pay, you're going to be paying like seven to 10 times more per CPU computing power unit than what you normally do if you were using like your Intel or ADM normal computer chip equivalent. So all those things are like getting really into nuts and bolts techie style. But what I would say is you need to understand the amount of data you need to move, how frequently you're going to move it, and then how much computing power you need to stand this up and make it worthwhile for a good external customer and user experience. And when you do that performance tracking, that performance management tracking, and you compute all that, that drives the budget you'll need to have a successful outcome in that project. As an end user, most of the tools right now, because they're so web enabled, they're based that you should have a, you know, for all intents and purposes, it should be like using Google, using Google search. That's the type, that's the bar that they try to reach. Um, for other things that are a little more complex, like generating video, generating audio, um, it's not as time specific. You're not, you may not get a result in five seconds. You might have to wait a little and it'll tell you while waiting, prompting and if it needs more inputs, it'll ask you. So I think it depends on your role, where you are in the process and um, how much, how robust you're trying to build this thing. Thanks, Victor. Yeah, and the, the thing that 
that came to mind, Victor, when you were you know, giving your you know, giving your response to um, the question was so. I mean, you're you're a tech guy, so you 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 understand some of the considerations. Like you talk, well, you got to know your CPUs and GPUs. But I'm sure that there were people out there when you started saying CPUs and GPUs, you know, their eyes got glassy and, you know, like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> um, so for me, you know, um, I want to get started. I want to play around with, you know, creating interesting video backgrounds. But I don't know if I have the right, you know, hardware to get started. Is there like a simple, you know, way to assess where I'm at so I know what I need without having to get into CPU, GPU, <laughs> data transfer? All of those things are important, but baby steps so that I can start in slowly. Yeah, I think um, a good way to think about it, and we do this sometimes, is we'll, we'll set up use cases, which is kind of like just a scenario of what you'd want it to do, the type of input and output you'd want. So if you're saying, hey, I have, uh, I want to create a script, but I want to hear it in audio format, and I want to see it written out in text. Okay, without giving away that, the you know, the keys to the kingdom, without giving away all your secrets and your IP, you could probably create a test case that and use one of the publicly available quote unquote premium free products out there to kind of get a feel for what you could get through those tools. Um, when you're ready to work on the real item that you don't want to share externally, you don't want it exposed on the internet, then you could use one of the paid base models and ensure that it has the right data privacy and security and like your instance is just yours nobody else is gonna get access to it. They're not gonna use it to share that with other folks that have nothing to do with you. Then you get into the paid aspects of that. And you, a lot of these tools have a paid version, which should be giving you those types of um, securities and uh, encapsulate, ring fence your work. So it's just for you. Um, anything beyond that, we're talking about companies building new applications. You gotta talk to Harv, myself and other folks like that. Uh, we could talk to you about what you'll need to consider, the type of budget, and also which tools are a tech stack, which companies are better in different aspects. So if you're talking healthcare, there's certain companies you'd wanna work with. If you're talking more creative stuff, video, audio stuff, there are probably some other companies you wanna deal with. Because each one has like their best in class, you know? Okay. I want to um, pivot for a second and acknowledge that uh, in the chat, Kathleen writes, the Dramatist Guild of America may be very interested in this if someone would like to connect. So there's an opportunity out there um, to connect. That's why I, I do these forums, because the premise is what I want us to get away from is complaining about the state of the entertainment industry. That's, like I said, not going to change anything. This is now getting uh, like-minded people uh, together and um, deciding what we are going to do to change, to, to see the change that we want to see in this industry. And that's why I think it's important, you know, we've, we've had um, panelists with deep and great experience sharing their knowledge um, and their time. Um, and I thank you all uh, for for doing that, and I thank you all for uh, you know sharing freely. And you know, uh, I, I think from the comments that I'm seeing that people have gotten information out of it. And we want to keep. That's why we we're going to be having these forums third Saturday every month between now through October. Um, this won't be the only topic that we're talking about. But again, the focus is is how do we empower ourselves to change, you know, to make the change that we want to see. And um, certainly learning new tools, I think learning AI. And um, I want to take this time to acknowledge that um, one of the, although I, uh, yeah, one of the people 
as you know, part of what we're doing is, is a television show. So I want to take a moment, just, I'm not going to embarrass you, I'm just going to say hello. <laughs> I'm just taking a moment to acknowledge that one of my casts from that show is here. Giselle, thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it. Um, and we are going to be shooting, God help us all, a short film <laughs> where we're going to be using AI. This is going to be my foray into AI. And um, so that's going to be, you know, show if you want to see, you want to hear us talk about it or bemoan the fact it didn't go well or whatever, uh, show up at the next forum and I'll have some some updates and I'll let you know how it went. But, um, you know, I, I, I think we had a great panel. I hopefully... You guys got some information. Uh, I like what, what Audra said. You know, you learn by doing. That's that's how you do it. And um, we didn't get a chance to get it in here. But one of the things, uh, however, you should know that Mr. Victor Smith is my first guest on the Contagia podcast, which premieres tonight um, at 8 p.m. Um, so and we talk about AI. So if you want to hear some more from Victor, um, please watch and or listen to that episode. Well, one of the things that we talked about is the idea of the an AI controller. I like that phrase. That's the way you should think of the human. You know, it's the a the human now is the AI controller because it still has to have context. It still has to have direction, um, and that's what the human provides. Um, so there's still a, there's still a need for um, human intervention, but we have to learn how to use this tool, and there's going to be new new skills. So I hope that. You know, we're not talking Terminator here. <laughs> we're talking this. We're, we're talking new tool that you know. It's scary not when you don't know something, but you can go and you can learn it, and maybe it might help you. Uh, I, I like you, Gary you, gave a great Gregory, you could say you could say we're not talking Terminator. We're talking Star Trek, because Star Trek is the the utopian vision of the future versus. Terminator yeah. being the dystopian. <laughs> and Jennifer is like Perfect. waving her hand wildly. Well, I, I was going to piggyback on all of that, like in, in, back to what even Brenda said, like artistic integrity, right? Like, or using these tools. There's, um, I mean, way back, let's go back to the microwave. That's going to destroy cooking. Did it destroy cooking? No. Did the convection oven destroy cooking? No. Um, it's been brought up by other people in this room and multiple conversations that I've had on like uh, synthesized music or that type of thing, sampling, is that going to destroy creative worlds? You know, it hasn't. Right. Um, I mean, I think what Audra says is lean into it, creatively play. We've got to evolve or perish. Let's lean into being part of the future. And especially if those of us that care about diversity, <laughs> right. If we're leading and cutting edge in this, our voice will be unstoppable. Right. We are people that think outside the box. We are people that, are, know that we're stronger together. We are people that take risks, uh, chosen family, chosen tools. Like, let's go forward and use this. We'll make a big difference if we're the ones that are like Darian is doing. I mean, Darian, you have nothing but an abundance mindset and you lean into this technology and it's going to make a difference for what we want to see on screen, the stories we want to hear and see. That's what I had to say on that. Definitely. And thanks for everyone that came. Yeah. Carlos, you have any, want to uh, give you a shot at uh, parting thoughts as well? Yes. Um, just trust the process. Use it. Obviously, don't give away all your, you know, don't put your social security on it. What you want to do is you want to just be able to become, you know, when somebody starts playing the piano, they just start kind of trying to come up with which keys are going to play the best notes. That's That's what you're doing. And over time, with practice, with anything like practicing drawing, practicing playing basketball, practicing with anything, you're going to get better and better results. But it's really your commitment to doing it or using it. And as long as you know which tool does what, and that's the part that interests you, just just go in and and, and get it get it done. Because that way, even if you have people against you or like, oh, don't do that, you don't have to tell them. Because when the when the industry starts moving and shifting, and they don't get that next job or they don't do whatever it is that they're afraid of. That's because they chose not to dive in. So if you're ahead of the game, you're ahead of the game. You know what I'm saying? So it just comes down to that. Here, here. Um, be ahead of the game. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about it. Um, you know, I strongly advise you 
um, take advantage. Um, be one of the, the pioneers and the early people who will learn how to use this tool. Um, it could be helpful to you. Uh, I want to thank everybody. Um, please follow Quintasia on LinkedIn, Facebook. All of this matters. Um, you know, you're, uh, you don't have to be an investor to, to, to be helpful. Um, you know, participation and, you know, audience engagement are very big metrics for us. So I hope that you found, um, you know, this information useful and helpful. And uh, I want to thank all of uh, our guests today, all of the panelists and all of the, and all of our attendees. Thank you so much.